Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics Podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's topic is the Clear Now story with my friend, Rick Tellez. How's it going, Rick? Uh, very well. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Joe. I'm very excited to talk to you. I talk to a lot of people. We publish three podcasts a week. And, you know, a lot of it's kind of the same. I shouldn't say all the same. But you hear some of the same terms, visibility, you know, digital platforms, different things like that. And this, what we're going to talk to today about customs clearance, which, by the way, impacts so many of us. And I, we were before we hit record, Rick and I were joking that I used to call it just the magic, the magic of <laughs> custom clearance. And he called it a, a black box. And I think what they're doing over at Clear Now is the future. And I think we're going to have this. And by the way, this is long overdue tech. So <laughs> anyway, Rick, please introduce yourself and your company. And please spell your company name. Perfect. No, thank you so much again. Uh, really appreciate you having me on. So as you mentioned, my name, Rick Telez, born and raised in Colorado. I'm with, uh, I'm the founder of Clear Now Corporation. And what does Clear Now do? So we're a digital uh, platform that enables customs clearance in uh, several countries now. And, you know, what we have ultimately done is, is created an Uber-like platform that uh, connects licensed customs brokers with, with importers. Interesting, interesting. I know this is one of the areas of supply chain that is largely paper-based and manual to this day. Even when we got all these cool technologies helping us with the over the road, going digital, we've got apps, but not when it comes to customs. Everything slows down to 1975. <laughs> Send me that paperwork. <laughs> That's right. They, they used to uh, fax it, uh, FedEx it. Now they email it. Uh, bottom line, it's, a, it's the same thing, right? It's just paper in a different format. When you get an email or any data that's uh, like a PDF, I always say it's static. It's not useful as there's no data analytics on it. It is static versus if it's in a system, it's dynamic. It can become insights at some point. We should hire you part of our marketing <laughs> and sales team. <laughs> that is a perfect example. That's exactly what we do. We take those documents. We extract the information. So that's where the AI and ML comes into play. But we create a transition that into digital data. So that becomes reality. The software itself identifies all of the words on that document. It knows who now the, the receiver is, who the shipper is, the value, the commodity, the HTS code. All of that stuff has now been converted. And so if you want to run a report or have an analytics in the future, you've got it. It came from that document. Yep. And by the way, I just had posted something on LinkedIn and it was actually it was about Flexport. We just talked about Flexport and I, great company. And one of the things I was saying about problem solving in the supply chain space, it kind of comes down to some things now. If I had a pro, you and I had a problem, we would say, well, let's get some data around it, right? Let's get a problem statement. Then let's get some data analytics. And then let's talk about what technologies we can use to maybe solve this problem, streamline this problem. And then we would say, we obviously have to have operational expertise. And last but not least, I want a partner. And I feel like we have that in a lot of the space in, our, in the logistics and supply chain. We have all those things. Just not until now, <laughs> we didn't have it when it came to customs. And by the way, guys, I I said this to Rick before we hit record. I've been, a, as a shipper, I was an automotive for a long time, and I shipped a lot of stuff back and forth to China and Thailand. And I never fully understood the process. I would meet with our broker. I would meet with people, and they would say things, and I would just, because I didn't want to look any more ignorant than I am, I would just go, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, blah, blah, blah. And then we would walk and I not know anything. So I want you to walk when we get in just a minute. I want you to walk us through the manual process, slow and steady. And then I want you to take us through the what it would look like with Clear Now. But first, Rick, tell us a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? And give us some career highlights before you started Clear Now. Okay. Well, sir, sure. So as I mentioned, uh, born in Colorado actually attended uh, University of Colorado Boulder. So uh, you I guys a got a big football game coming up. 
Tell you what, every year that's what we say. One of these years, <laughs> it'll end our disappointment. <laughs> but, now, did you go to University of Colorado? Yeah, in uh, in Boulder. As as a Michigan Wolverine, I can tell you this: uh, there was this one last minute hail mary years ago. It still haunts me. Michigan's winning the whole game, and then some quarterback just launched an impossible throw. No way. You're just like, you're already ready. Turn the TV off. Touchdown. Game over. Colorado won. It was, I was like, oh, no Michigan fan will ever not remember that. <laughs> well, that's happened plenty of times to us, that's for sure. <laughs> Yep. So you grew up in Bull. You ended up going to University of Colorado. Grew up in, you study in there? Denver, Colorado. Yeah, and uh, ended up in at university in Boulder. But uh, you know, background of loving to uh, ski, and up until I guess I was sixteen, and then transitioned over to snowboarding. Typical uh, Colorado kid. I loved the outdoors and and uh, in, enjoyed certainly that environment. Nice, nice. Well, you're not doing that. Where, by the way, where are you at based at now? We're in Santa Clara, California, so we're in the heart of Silicon Valley. Very nice, very nice. So what did you study at school? Uh, so I'm actually a psych major. That's uh, how you ended up in logistics. <laughs> try, <laughs> I, I knew there was plenty of subject to, to keep me busy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have a family member who's an investment counselor, and they always say it's 90% counselor 10 percent investment <laughs> <laughs> there you go so give us some career highlights where'd you start your career and then give us just some bullet points about your career before you started clear now sure so I, I think a funny beginning is that it's probably started out at least uh planted the seeds when i was in college had uh, a part-time job actually with a company called airborne express at the time and they were, you know, like the equivalent of the FedEx, you know, UPS. I know them very well. Yeah. And so I worked as a part-time office agent. So I was actually on a typewriter typing up these bill of ladings and way bills in triplicate. Yeah. Um, you young people, go ahead and Google uh, typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's oh, a it's, very it's early a, computer. <laughs> it's the truth. So I, I can still hear the clicks. I can, I can still feel myself swiping. I mean, and no, and, no it, and it wasn't out. swiping a screen either. It was swiping a lever. But that's where I started, right? And, and I, I did that for you know a year and several different things within that office and helped out. And it was part-time, four hours after class in the afternoon. But uh, really, that kind of exposed me to the industry. Didn't Airborne Express get bought out by DHL? You got it. And and that is ultimately who I ended up working for, which was DHL, so 20 plus years. And it, But it all started with that initial exposure in college. And, and it was funny because at the time I was on the other side, right? I was, a, even if you're a part-time employee and an office clerk working 20 hours a week, you had to join the union. So I was actually a teamster for a while, right? And and so I got to see the the business on that side. And then when I obviously after school, I think I asked for a, a deposit after I graduated after about three or four months of travel. And my mother said, you need to get a job. <laughs> this is the <laughs> this is the last deposit. <laughs> yes, my my I my daughter one of my daughters said to me, after 22 years of loyal service, I'm just being let go with no severance. I was like, yes, that's how it works. <laughs> you're on it and you're done now. College yeah, is over. Exactly. Hope you saved. But yeah, so uh, it came back and, and actually uh, the regional director in at the time in Boulder, covered covered Boulder and Denver, uh, entire you know, region, had uh, reached out and said, hey, listen, we understand that you've, you know, I, I only worked for them for uh, a year or so. But they had somehow remembered me and they said, uh, we're hiring, we're reaching out to college grads and we would like you to be, you know, since you're already exposed, we, we know you, we think you would be a great fit and, and we'd like you to become a future leader of the company and kind of laid out a, the process of how that would look, right? And working in different divisions of the company and this is the progression plan and, and this is how uh, uh, what we would set up and, and, and drive for you. So I did it. I left and, and went for it. Yep. And by the way, right now we have lots of small parcel. Obviously, you start with UPS and FedEx, but we now know there's another dozen more. I just talked to Nate Skyver on a podcast about all the different parcel solutions, right? If you want to call it that. But for a while, it just seemed like UPS and FedEx and then Airborne Express was small parcel, got bought by DHL, and they competed in small parcel for a while. And then they left. And I always had it in my head 
this is years, many years ago, the DHL, which is a German company, left the U.S. But that was just the parcel piece. And by the way, it, that was just the final part, the final mile part, part of it. DHL is alive and well within these parcel space. They do a lot of collection and sortation. And then they use other, I think they use the post office and others to get those final mile. Absolutely. Which is the expensive part. So DHL is still a huge player in it, but but Airborne Express or the old Airborne Express, which would be that final mile piece, no more. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, and, and at the time, I mean... They were 20 was, years early. <laughs> it, it was a wild ride, too, uh, let me tell you. You know, but you're, you're absolutely correct. And, and one thing they realized at the time of the acquisition was that uh, a foreign country or company could not own more than 51% of an airline. And that's what Airborne Express was at the time. So it was very interesting how that deal then came out and unfolded. And they tried to compete for a while, but obviously that, that ended somewhere around 2009, I believe. So DHL is an absolute juggernaut. I think if you look, you'll see it's much bigger than FedEx or UPS. Largest in the world. Yeah, it is. I, I interviewed the CEO of one of their divisions, which is... <laughs> Massive. He's based yeah. in Texas. But anyway, let's switch gears for a sec. When and why did you start Clear Now? And by the way, you should spell that one more time. <laughs> yeah, sure. So Clear Now is actually spelled with a K. It's K L E A R N O W. So Clear Now Corp. And I think the genesis of the company was was ultimately my uh, through my experience. And, and I have to start and preface by I, I respect how much and how difficult what freight forwarders do, what what the DHLs, the FedExes, the UPSs, the agilities, the DSVs, what they do is extremely complicated. Everybody yeah. says, oh, you're just moving something from point A to point B. It's not that simple. Right? Yeah, if, I, if I could add something to that, when you think about over the road, let's just say, Rick, you, uh, you've done many over the road shipments. Over the road, there's a, there's a shipper, and if, we'll talk about domestic. There's a shipper, and then there's maybe a carrier. And I think 60%, 70% of the time, there's just a carrier. The carrier comes, moves it to the receiver. So three people involved. Three, three, We'll say three touches. Three companies, maybe four or five touches. Now you talk about freight forwarding. There's like 14 or 15 touches. And you're not dealing with a company from two states over that speaks your language is in your time zone. You're talking multiple countries time zones, cultures, different businesses, business, different business structures, laws, everything's different. Everything. It is a much, much harder biz. It really none is. Of it's, none of it's easy, but that, that is harder. So I, to your point, much, much respect to those. Yeah, fellas. much respect to them. And, and you know, again, I, I like to think that we're actually helping them, right? I mean, because they're going to do what they do well, which is move the products move the goods around the world. What we've done is, and again, it came from my experience in working in each of those divisions of the company, operations, hubs and gateways, customer service type uh, area, customs itself, uh, heck, work in, in the labor group, right? And, and everything we did, there was similar pain points. And certainly on my last role within sales, the way we handled that pain point was you, you add people and you add money. Right. And it ultimately ends up costing the importer more money. You say, well, I'm going to need twenty five dollars per shipment or I'm going to need an extra thirty dollars for this or that. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to accommodate the unique customization that they have in their supply chain. And you have to account for all of those pain points with customs. And you have to say, well, we know we're going to have to hire X number more people to handle that. Their paperwork is unique. They have six hundred lines on each shipment. So we're going to have to have people typing even more. So we think uh, in order to handle their business, we're going to raise their rates to X, right? And, and in, in the end, every customer service call, it felt like was coming, well, where's my package? <laughs> and you'd give them 14 beautiful milestones right on our website. Oh, look at this. It departed here. It arrived here. It stayed there. Yeah, that's, you called it the black box before we hit record. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and 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 I've again, I've I've joked about. I've been on, on as a logistics company. I've been involved with it, but I've also been as an advisor, but also as a shipper for many years. And you really just start to just lean on the broker, and depending what they the customs broker, and depending what they say, they're not technology companies. I mean, 
I imagine some of them would be listening in my podcast, I hope, and say, we're more technology than you know. But in my experience, that is not where they're coming from. And by the way, this is the whole industry. There's the operational expertise, and you've got plenty of that. But then there's the technologist. And we we're over time merging those roles, but we're all coming from one of those backgrounds. And 100%. there's nobody who says, yep, I grew up in this industry and I'm I'm absolutely both. Very few people can say that. That would be a unicorn. Yeah. Well, I, my friend Sharm always says that. he was he, He's going to be on my podcast soon. And he's got that background. He was an IT guy when I met him. And then he became a freight broker. I mean, a flex, freight forwarder. But anyway, what year did you start the company? And I know you have two partners. How did you guys come together? Tell us a little bit about that Genesis story. And, yeah, and sure. how you guys started. And did you guys get funding? I mean, do you have to go back to the wife or girlfriend and say, hey, we're going to be poor now? I mean, how did you tell us a little bit about this? <laughs> that, that was part of the story, <laughs> certainly. So obviously, uh, after 20 years in, in a career, I was in a different stage of my life than most startup uh, companies, right? They usually, kids out of college, drop out of college, have a great idea, the software background, and, and go for it. Drop it. You got nothing to lose. And you were used you were used to living indoors and eating every day. <laughs> <laughs> in a nice place. <laughs> nice cars, you know, nice vacations, uh, you know, all of that. But uh, you know, so again, like I said, I happen to live in the same community as as my co founders, Ulf Sandberg and Sam Tiagi. Approached Ulf, who had has an incredible technology background been with many startups, famous ones even, had incredible eggs, has done very well in his life. He's actually retired now, sadly. I think that's the first time I've said it out loud. I've been in denial. But he was Good ultimately... for him, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> He's having a great time. <laughs> but it was it was Ulf that kind of... I, I, I sat down with him and said, here's what I see in, in the industry. Here, here's, here's what I think. And what, and what did you describe the problem as? Well, I told him, I said, uh, customs clearance is a complete nightmare. The collection of duties and taxes uh, is a complete nightmare. The actual process itself of getting something cleared, nobody knows what's going on. Everybody says we've turned it over to the broker. Well, that doesn't do me any good, right? I can't give an ETA. I can't give any more detail. I've turned it over to the broker. You ask the broker, what have you done with it? Well, I've submitted it to customs. I'm just waiting. Well, what do you mean? What are you waiting for? Right. And as we come to find out, uh, you know, as I dig deeper and deeper and deeper, um, there's an instant message returned from the, from customs. So I don't know what everybody was waiting for, but, but it wasn't CVP they were waiting for. Right. And, and so there's this, this communication gap and, and break in the communication process that, that causes part of this you know, issue of, of opaqueness. And so, the, the genesis, obviously, was the background, introduced uh, the problem to Ulf. Uh, we talked about it, went through it, came up with an idea, and then kicked it off. And, and soon we had something on our hands. We molded over, created something. And then uh, right when we realized we had something, it was actually my father-in-law, Dr. Norm Woods, that introduced me to another member of the country club, which was Sam Tiagi. And uh, he, he said, uh, apparently they were golfing one day. And Dr. Woods said, uh, Sam, you, know, you really got to talk to Ulf and, and my, uh, my son-in-law, Rick. I, I think they're on to something great. I think they could use your business background and, and right. certainly finance expertise to, to help get this thing off the ground. And the rest is history, as they say, right? So and what year so was that? That was in late 2017. We had been cooking it, obviously, for, for a year prior to that. And that was the year that was, you know, no pay. That was the the poor year. Yeah, that's that that's why your father in law had to pick somebody brain because his daughter got used to living indoors, <laughs> eating every day. He said, he said "Enough's <laughs> enough. We we got to get this thing going. They're going to move in with us if we're not careful. <laughs> careful, <laughs> but yeah. So uh, we kicked it off uh, formally incorporated in 2018 March, and that was our first seed round. You know, uh, before that, it was just uh, out of pocket, right? Uh, it was it was Ulf. And, you know, the, as we've gone from seed to series A to now we're past series B, I think we've raised somewhere close to $80 million. And wow. It, Congratulations. It's been, it's been incredible. No, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, like I say, I think the trifecta is where we can point to why we have been successful, right? We were able to put that magic recipe together that says we've got subject matter expert, 
we've got technology expert and we've got a business expert that that has has been successful uh in his past as well which sam certainly had yep so i want to go through this i want to you have to take us through a scenario so let's okay i'll let you i'll let you invent the uh the shipment sure it's gotta be so let's assume it's somewhere in china i'm assuming and then moving to here so give me a scenario and take us through the old way yeah let's 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 use furniture we all use furniture we all oh my oh my god i gotta tell you this my daughter (laughs) and she lives in portland ordered a couch during covid and it was i think seven months before they got it I said, and when they finally got there, I go, does it look like you thought it should? Because like you forgot what you ordered at that point. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good example is my. Yeah. We're, we're all sitting on it last night watching a game, right? Yep. So assuming, take us through the, the, the manual process and what that looks like. So go ahead. Pre, pre clear now, what that would look like is a container. And I think we all know what a shipping container is now yep. after the news, right? So it ends up on a, on a container, on a vessel, a shipping vessel. Uh, some carry 2,000 up to, I think they're up to 20,000 now uh, of these containers can be on a ship. Anyway, these containers get filled at certain manufacturing locations around the world. Let's yep. say this one was done in China. So right at the time where the container is filled and they've closed the door, somebody in China in that plant is creating what's called a packing list. They said, okay, here's the final, this is everything that made made it into this container. Because it might not have been everything on that purchase order, right? (laughs) Oh, it didn't fit, uh, the boxes, something happened, we had, so whatever was finally landed in that container is on the packing list. Okay, so that's one individual that has created a, a manual piece of paper. Does he print that piece of paper out? <laughs> Which is, how many times do you hear that in our life now? Oh, make sure you print that out for me <laughs> and attach to the container. It, it, it was painful. It was painful. But So what next? Help is here. We, we, we've solved it, though, okay? So everything I'm describing is in the past. So that, that piece of paper is created, which is the packing list. The packing list is then shared with the importer, with the freight forwarder, with the customs broker, and they ultimately say, hey, this is what's coming. So now the commercial invoice needs to match that, right? So they've got to create the commercial invoice. Another document created by somebody else that says, okay, this is the value of all of those contents that are on that packing list. And and this is ultimately the value where you're going to declare for when that furniture lands in the port of Los Angeles, okay? Well, let me ask you. Let me ask a quick question. So, I've I've gotten large shipments from China in the past, and uh, this is pre clear, pre clear now. Of course, they were supposed to send a whole bunch of stuff that when we opened up the container, you can't tell for like a half a day what you actually got. And at some point, you realize, hey, the stuff that I thought would be in here isn't in here. At that, and 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 here's the problem: we already paid. We paid them for it. And it says, it says, here's, here's the invoice. Here's the packing list. And I go, it's on the packing list. And it's on the invoice. I paid for it. It's supposed to be in the box. It's not in the box. What do I do in this? Yeah. And you can imagine that that part of. I used uh, to just complain financing. to my people. <laughs> well, the fi- think about the problem with financing that, right? It, it, it requires trust. It re- and so the bank is, is ultimately lending this furniture company money to have this stuff manufactured. How do they know that it's going to arrive and, and, and it's going to be what, what was ordered and what was paid for? So th- that's a whole, I mean, we could go on for hours just on that component alone. But for this particular shipment example, we now have a packing list and, and, a, and a commercial invoice. Then another party is involved, which is a freight forwarder or the steamship line, right, that creates the bill of lading. It's another document. So you need at least these three documents. Then it, you need to understand wh- which country it's going to. Right, because you have to understand the origin, de- origin country and destination country, which is then going to dictate another group of rules that customs brokers have to abide by. Right, there are certain trade agreements. There are you know all types of certifications and documents that may rec- be required. Lacey Act certificates. This is packed in wood and it originated in China, so it needed to be fumigated and have a stamped certificate that said it was fumigated properly. I, I mean. It, Let's face it, we're human beings, and human beings are incredible at making things difficult, and and this is no difference, right? This we've absolutely made a a nightmare out of. But software is is really helping us untangle this, and that's what ClearNow has done. But 
with this example, we finally get all of the documents. Let's say we got all of our documents. You could end up with 30 emails in communication with your freight forwarder, wow. your customs broker, the importer themselves, the vendor, the supplier. All of these people are getting that, That's emails. assuming there is no gap like I just described. Right. Exactly. Double or triple it if there's yeah. the... Exactly, if there's a problem, right? But somebody has to gather all of these emails. And it's typically left up either to a warehouse manager for the importer, the people that are buying it, or they may outsource it and say, listen, I don't want to deal with all of these 30 emails. Licensed customs broker, you deal with it, I'll pay you, right? So the customs broker, he or she gathers all of these emails, tries to make sense of it. Now get this, they're actually printing out these documents and creating a nice file folder, much like you would see in, a, a, in, in, an, old, in an old doctor's office. Because that doctor's office used to have... I'm an old folder. <laughs> you got it. There it is. And, and that is, is how they're storing these records. They're printing it out, putting it in a file folder. And guess what I, what I was doing back then, right? I'd have a typewriter stand, and i put those documents on that typewriter stand, and i begin to key in the entry. I'm typing in all of that information from those documents. And if I could just interject here, one of, one of the things is if you want to talk about, and I, you will talk about this more when we get there, but I'll, I'll, I'll give the layman's terms. If you want to take advantage of artificial intelligence, machine learning, we, we've had that for years, but you need, you need to have that algorithm, right? We all hear the algorithm all the time. You also need computing power. We have that computing power now. We didn't always. Right. And then you need tons of data. And in the past, whether it was over the road or freight forwarded from, you know, air freight or ocean freight, that information was in file folders, literally file folders and cabinets. We didn't have access. And then for a minute, we had systems that weren't connected. And so you got your little bit of information. I got my little bit. Only in the last, I'll say five, 10 years, have we gotten to a place where you have the algorithm, you have the computing power, and now all the data in in a format that we can start doing scenarios and that's right. what you're doing with ai and ml and, and that's correct. where we get these data insights and again you don't get data insights when it's in a file folder in a cabinet at your customs broker yeah 100 percent. and and we're doing for uh customs brokers what electronic medical records did for doctor's offices right we've converted all of this now into digital and so anyway we we get finally to the point where that container arrives at the port and it's probably already at the port. It's probably unloaded and waiting to be picked up when the broker finally gets this printed folder. And, and now they've got to scramble and get this entry submitted to CBP, which is, you know, Customs Border Protection, which then approves or rejects whether or not those goods can, can come into the country. And there's a lot that goes into that. But lots of rules on that. And lots I've, of rules. I've heard some, I've interviewed freight forwarders and I've heard some horror stories where somebody thought I can import that. And by the way, a lot of times with health supplements where they make claims that they shouldn't have, they go, nope, this isn't coming in this country. I don't know what they do. I guess they just dispose of it because they're not worth sending back. So there's lots of issues at that point, right? Oh, absolutely. And it can be very painful if you didn't follow the rules. So so then what happens when the, what do you call it? The customs? Licensed customs broker actually has somebody called a data entry clerk. If if they're large enough, they have a data entry clerk <laughs> or they have to type it themselves if they're a smaller, you know, mom and pop type broker. And really, the, they were the ones that held that local knowledge. Uh, the history of licensed customs brokers was the, tr was the, the tribal knowledge. Is yeah, the tribal it, knowledge. Right? And you had to be based in that port, right? And you actually went out there with your clipboard and inspected that container when it got offloaded. And then you took your inspection report and you went back to customs and submitted the, the declaration and said, I attest that everything is true and accurate. That was the history. And, and then all of a sudden, the you know, U.S. began to make these this digital change and we launched what was called ACE, which is, uh, you know, essentially the government saying we want to receive all of our records electronically. OK, so all of the carriers, all of the customs brokers, everybody had to use ACE. And so now you have all of these data entry clerks manually typing and, and submitting these entries via ACE. And you need a ABI software to do that. Well. Clear now is an ABI software provider. What does ABI stand for? So ABI, I forget the acronym for that. That CVP is assigned to that one, but it's it's what gives you the authority to send a transmission to the government. 
and then receive the transmission. This is this is where we, uh, you know, where we truly do need standardization and some regulations that make. This is where the government can put some nice guardrails on it, so we can get what we need and speed speed this process. Yeah, it, it, it's the it's the automated broker interface is is what it stands for. Okay, government's good at, at creating those things, but so you've typed this in now, and and if you're lucky. You did it before the container ran out of free days because as an importer, you have an agreement with your freight forwarder or with the steamship line, the owner of the container that those that the furniture is in, that you get it for so many free days within that port. Right. Typically four. You go over four. Okay, well, now it's $250 a day for the first three days. Yeah, they, they will charge you for first the, for the, the port will charge you for the space. And I think they'll actually charge the freight forwarder. And then they also get what they call demurrage. Is that what is demurrage? That is is the demurrage, right? And then the per diem, the per diem is the rent on the container. Yeah. So you're getting. (laughs) And and that gets paid to the owner of the container. Yeah. I don't know what those containers actually cost, but you could pay for a container with a few of those weeks. (laughs) (laughs) 10 days you could buy one. But yeah, anyway, I mean, you, you can end up with some costly ramifications for not getting this entry done in time and collecting it. So you've submitted this through this this system, and now what are the what is the how long does it take to clear customs? So customs, it's instantaneous, and now and, and that's what the magic of what our system has done is we've made this transparent. So all of these automatic responses, are they checking these containers? No, absolutely not. CBP does not check the container. I, I think it's less than one percent, maybe less than two percent actually get inspected. I also hear people say that that that. Container will clear customs in Chicago, even though it came from L.A. How does that work? Well, so think about it in the past. The L.A. broker, let's say your broker was in Chicago, right? And and it actually arrived into L.A. You would have to work and have a relationship with a broker in L.A. to help you clear that. Well, since, forget the year, we, we went national. So now brokers can, can clear things in any port in the country. So when something arrives in its ultimate destination is Chicago, but it arrives in LA and it's going to end up on a rail and trucks and, and, and a network to get delivered to, to Chicago. You don't want to pay taxes and, and do all of that until it actually formally gets entered into the country. So you, you it basically goes in bond, which you're telling the government, I haven't opened it yet. I haven't taken possession of it yet. So I don't owe duties and taxes yet. And so when it finally arrives in Chicago, that's when you're going to declare that it's finally entered. And and that's when you owe money, and that's where a, a commercial transaction takes so, place. So so let me ask one more basic question. I know I'm just slowing you down here, but when you say there's these custom there's there's custom broker, and I'm assuming they are vouching for these shippers who are involved. And so how do how do they know that that that's furniture and not um, something that's not supposed to come here? Yeah. So there's due diligence that's required, right? And that's where we also help our the licensed customs brokers that are on our platform. Which is we've we've vetted those customers to say that they are ah, nice, nice, they're nice. doing what they say they're doing right. We have to they have to get a power of attorney. The broker has to get a power of attorney signed by the importer, and they have to go through some steps. Right? They need a, an actual license or or ID from an executive or an officer of the company that says I attest to this is what we're doing. This is what we're shipping, and I'm giving you the power uh, of attorney to clear our goods. And so there's a there's a, a bit of a dance that happens. Uh, in order to connect these parties. I know this in the last 20 years as we've done more and more business with China. I had some friends here in automotive land in Michigan who found a great supplier, you know, good price, supposedly good quality, but no one's ever heard of them and they're in China. And I remember the freight forwarder saying, well, we have people in China. We'll go out there and we'll look and see if there's actually a factory there. (laughs) And I was like, is that how this works? Like that just seems kind of crazy, but... You know, and and most have an established track record now. But you know, if you're a new company starting out, yeah, you well, need all to... these people on Alibaba. I mean, there's a million. Yeah, sure. Well, Amazon. From what I understand, most of the people on Amazon sellers are from China. Yes, foreign importers, and that's another registration process the licensed custom broker has to help you do and perform. And uh, you know, so there, it's. Right. So what's the final steps in this process? What do they got to do to get this in? Final steps are if you're lucky, you got a cargo release and entry summary release in time before your container ended up in Demerich at that port. Then you received, if you're the importer, you received an email 
from the customs broker that says, ah, you're green light, good to go. You can go ahead and have this thing picked up now. Thanks for the heads up, but uh, you're telling me I have six hours left to get this thing picked up before I have fines and penalties, right? So now you call Joe's trucking company and say, I need you to urgently get over there, get this thing picked up. Here's your delivery order. You have another document that you have to create. And it says, this is the you know port of arrival. This is the terminal. This is the sky. You know, all of the data that's required. And then Joe's trucking has to run down, get an appointment, get a chassis, get in line pick up that container, which it doesn't happen seamlessly, right? Because nobody is connected. Nobody can see what everybody else is doing when things are available. It's no visibility visibility that it's close. Because if I knew this typically takes six hours from here to here, I can call my trucking company the day before and go, hey, we're getting close. 100%. Probably tomorrow and and, uh, be on call and if, you know, make those arrangements. And, And again, after a while, we're using a system like Clear now. I have analytics, and I say ninety percent of the time this is six hours or less when it hits this milestone. Sure. Well, and and that's the final mile, right? So now it's been picked up by Joe's Trucking. It gets delivered to the warehouse. Don't forget, it's got to get returned back, and and it's got to get what's called gated back in. That container needs to be gated back in. So if that trucking company, if Joe's Trucking Company, just took it to their storage yard and left that container there. You as the importer are responsible for the rent. <laughs> Why did you take five days to return that container? Uh, you know, I have to pay an extra $600 for that. Like, you know, it's importers that are left holding the bag for every step of the way of this. And yeah. so they need to think about that when they're pricing the cost of their goods, right? And so what ends up happening? We end up paying way more for a couch than what we should have to because they have to anticipate they're going to have this cost, the shipping costs, the broker costs, the per diem costs, the demerge costs. They need to build that all into their cost model before they give it to us at a sale price, right? And so could it be cheaper? Should Could they sell more goods if they were able to reduce their costs? Now they can, we're clear now. Excellent. So let's switch gears. Let's talk about the streamlined process that would clear now. So it's same, same furniture being imported. Walk you me through it. it. I won't ask a whole bunch of basic questions. No problem. No problem. (laughs) So we we give that importer a unique email address, right? We we call it uh, Joe's Furniture at clearnow.net. And we say, listen, we know you're going to have, we don't want you to change anything. We know you're going to have 30 different emails for a container that you're bringing into the country. Just give everyone this email. Have this copied in on every one of those 30 emails and we'll take care of the rest. So the software is ingesting all of the data, both the text in the body of the email, as well as any attachments that are attached to those emails. It's capturing those documents. Again, it's creating a digital version of that document, right? Where we, we've got, okay, here's a copy of it. But as I mentioned earlier, we are now making sense, intelligent data. We call, I call them digital assets. Now the name on that, uh, on that bill of lading I know who, what the name is, right? The software says, oh, this is the shipper. This is the receiver. It's able to identify and classify and do all of this for us. And it moves it right into your system. It moves it right into the system. And so I have a, I've, I have a database of all my sh- sh- shipments. You got Fields it. all filled out. All and again, filled out. I went from my PDF or whatever document that was attached, a Word document or an Excel document yeah, into... Right. Something, by the way, another thing, if you're managing your supply chain with Excel spreadsheets, stop at their software for that. Now, that's, that's a, that's a given these days, but now I've taken that information from static and not usable to dynamic and part of my decision making. I have now have new insights. We've taken all of that unstructured data. So this is, so this email base. So you're using some sort of intelligent process automation to move that right from an email. Boom. So I don't need a clerk to add that in. You don't need anything. We create a shipment on our platform that it's a cloud-based platform that the importer can log into and the broker can log into. They both see the same thing. They both see all of the documents. They both see all of the data. They both can run reports, uh, do whatever they need to. They can communicate with each other, whatever needs to be done. But ultimately, since we've, we've captured all of that data, if the government asks for an ISF to be filed, which is required after 9-11, well, after 9-11 occurred, which we just, we just passed the, the anniversary, but after 9-11, the U.S. government dictated that an ISF, an international security filing, needed to be filed for anything coming into the country. We want to know who's, who sold it, who's buying it, what it's valued is, 
why are you bringing it in? Like, we need some critical data components. There's 13 data fields that they want to know for any of those containers coming into the country. And they give it a red light, green light, right? They, they can actually say, no, don't even put that on the ship because we're not going to accept it. They can go that far. But ultimately, uh, an ISF needs to be filed. So when it has to be filed, the software can file it for you. It's, it's instant Very because nice. they've already captured nice. the necessary data off of the documents. So that's filed for you. Right. We can communicate with with the freight forwarder and the customs broker and the importer that everybody's communicating on the same platform now, sees the same thing. The trucking company. So our, our drayage uh, module or our drayage component that we've released recently allows the trucking company like we just talked about Joe's trucking, how they find out last minute it, you wanted to give him 24 hours. We give him four weeks. We give Joe's trucking company a mom and pop outfit with 15 trucks. We give them the opportunity to work on our platform and bid on business that they can then, you know, easily distribute their workforce, right? They can say, okay, I've got work for 20 guys for the next 30 days and and they can start planning. And, And, you know, that is something that they haven't been able to do before. They get the last minute phone call and then they get yelled at as to why things are late and why am I paying penalties and why, why, why? And by the way, we have this constant trucking shortage. And again, so much of it is related just to that. If 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 you are a trucker and somebody says, uh, yeah, pick that up and it's last minute or it, tends, and it ends up being 12 hours late, you miss a family function. You miss your next pickup. You, That's right. you, you're losing money. You're losing your personal time. You're losing your life. I mean, that's what it is. This is this time is life, right? Yeah, you're right. And we're giving them a, a way to have a, a have a personal life, right? Because they can manage their resources. They can decide this is the job I'm going to take and completely plan out the, their next four weeks because they can see it on the platform. One other thing, when we were prepping for this, you mentioned, you know, when we had that port congestion out west on the West Coast. And by the way, I don't pay close attention daily, but I know a lot of that port congestion moved to the East Coast because of the potential strike on the West Coast. And you said, if somebody has it, something on a ship and says, you know what, I don't want to, I don't want to be part of that congestion. I want to move that to another port, let's say Oakland. You guys can do that in the system. In the system, automatically we can enter, we can update all of those entries to reflect the new port of entry. And, and trust me, it, it will not be accepted. It will be rejected by customs if it doesn't have the proper port of entry code. If it said, I'm, I'm supposed to deliver to Port of LA, and then you decide I'm going to switch, there's no switch. If I show up in a port, uh, if I show up in Oakland, they're, they're not going to accept my container. Correct. And they don't care about the, they, they've got their own rules to follow. They, they, about, yeah. It's national security. Right. That's your problem. It's not their problem. They, they won't accept, you know, they just won't accept it. So during the height of our pain during COVID, they were diverting those, those vessels. Well, everybody had to then manually update all of those entries that were coming into those ports to reflect Oakland or to reflect Washington or wherever they were headed. And that's not to mention, I mean, the, uh, I mean, clear now was fortunate. To and then communicate to... with everybody and tell them this is happening. Oh, it's, it's... sure. Well, in 30 advance. more email, 30 more emails. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I sent you that email. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I love what you're doing. And I, you, a few years back, uh, a guy who I think very highly of a vice president of a large manufacturer, they spend a ton of money. And he said to me, how much longer are we going to use email for this? And because he, what he was tired of is having a great 3PL, but letting the system of record be outside of that, you know, and where I say, Hey, Rick, I'm going to charge you an extra 300 bucks for this reason. And you, and you respond, okay. But then later on, when, when the bill comes, somebody goes, Hey, what's going on here? <laughs> the invoice is different than the quote. Yep. So we, we need every, so when you mentioned emails, uh, your emails are going right into the system. So there's never a, a place where you go, no, we don't have record of that. Exactly. All of those emails are captured and stored. One source on of truth. Once you got it. Like I said, I, we, we're going to send you an offer letter, uh, sales and marketing. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> but one source of truth is here's the approval email. This is, you know, you told us to use that HTS code. You uploaded a receipt of your own. You can upload documents that you want to attach to that shipment. You can do whatever you like as the importer, right? Because you are technically responsible. And so one thing that we are doing for compliance 
for these importers is we are checking that box for, for CVP that says you shall keep records and, and have them available if we so choose to ask for them. And it's, it's an electronic uh, records uh, keeping requirement that they have. They can't point to the broker and say, my broker keeps them and that's why I'm compliant. That, that doesn't suffice. You actually have to have them. Rick, so I noticed I was online, I looked on LinkedIn and you have hundreds of employees doing this. So I'm assuming you have a lot of data analytics from some of your early companies now. Are they starting to use some of the data analytics and say, here's how we're going to be making smart, smarter decisions here? A hundred percent. We, we've, and, and this is fantastic. What our customer success team is now enabled to do is they now have the power of data to go to our customers and say, let's go during our next QBR. I'm going to show you where all of your pain points were, where you spent money by shipping something through Norfolk, right? And this was the trickle down effect of that decision. While you saved $500 on the freight of moving that container, it actually cost you an extra fifteen hundred because it had to sit in a storage yard. It had to be picked up. You had to pay per diem. You had to do all of these things, right? Whereas if you had just shipped it through New Jersey and railed it, you would have saved X. So with that power of data, we are enabling now customers to make intelligent decisions for the future that are going to save them money. Yep. One other thing, when we were prepping, I asked you a little bit about integration, because I know we have, people have transportation management systems, they have ERPs, they have WMS, and you said this is a digital platform. So explain explain how, how this fits into, I'll say, the tech stack. Sure. So it's, you know, as you can imagine, it's it uses the latest of technology available to us in the, in the market, in the industry. And it's a microservices-based platform. All cloud, right? Yeah, all cloud-based, AWS. We actually have others that, that, you know, for those that refuse to use AWS, we can offer our customers something different. But nonetheless, we, we have the ability for anybody to log in from anywhere and see and manage their business. Now, would you like to extract that data? And, and use our API or, or have an EDI connection of some sort, we will absolutely help you do that into your existing system. We're currently working with SAP to, to offer customers that solution as well. But in the end, you, you have availability. You don't have to have a download of any software. You don't have to have anything that resides on your premises, right? <laughs> right. which from a security perspective, you don't want that anyway, if you can avoid it. And most people are, have moved to the cloud as we know it today anyway. But, you know, in the end, that's, that's what we offer our customers. That's fantastic. That's, th- this is long overdue. And I tell you what, another thing, years ago, somebody said to me, technology is just process in a box. And I was like, you know, that you can't create a software like yours without saying, let's whiteboard this and let's talk about the process steps. Let's really understand each of those steps and then create those milestones and create those fields. It doesn't begin with, I will create cool technology. And so this kind of forces a discipline and then you start having timing around those milestones, which again, we've learned this across the entire supply chain. This is what we need. And, you know, as a shipper, I can say, put my shipper hat on for a moment. We want end to end from the time I get the order to the time I get paid, I want end-to-end visibility. And for years, I've been hearing in my podcast, we had end-to-end visibility of the two days on, on in a truck. <laughs> That's fantastic, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and or two days in a warehouse or maybe on the ocean. If you're using, sure. again, the guys at Flexport have done some some great things there. but And I think some of the others are doing it too now. But I really need to get to that place where I've got end to end and you guys just filled in a gap because there was always that black hole, that gap that was the no tech zone. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. That is a good way to yeah, put it. The no tech just, zone. <laughs> so you, you can't. You have to fax things. You have to ship them. You have to, see, you have to send PDFs. That's the only thing they like. That's right. And, and to your point, what we, what we had done is we partnered with Project 44 this year. Right, which ah, they are they're supposed to be on my podcast again. <laughs> industry leader at, at that end to end visibility, at that track and trace piece, right? They've integrated, you know, with thousands, I believe, across the world. And so for us to be able to partner, because again, they had the no tech zone that they weren't able to integrate with anybody. Yeah. Right. They, they, so they're they're blind. So when the two of us join forces, you we've literally 
enabled a, a true holistic end to end view that nobody else can provide. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic what they're doing. I mean, they've grown like a weed and I exchanged text or messages with, with Jet. He's supposed to be on my podcast. I guess he's a busy man these days, yes, <laughs> but, sure but this is fantastic. So uh, one other thing while we're talking. Again, I noticed you guys have hundreds of employees on LinkedIn. So talk a little bit about just how you and your partners have kind of managed this. What I'll, it's got to be explosive growth given the the funding you're getting and the, all those employees. Talk about how you've managed to keep the, to grow that. You had to have the right culture. You had to have the right product. Everything had to be clicking. So talk a little bit about how you've grown this because that's – that's as challenging as anything else we discussed today. <laughs> and, and even more so, right? I mean, the engineers have their problems. We had our problems uh, on the business side, which was exactly that that scale. How do you, and I think the key was, and, and this is really something that uh, Sam was, was integral in by putting the foundation of our business rules and systems and softwares in place that we said, this is going to be how we manage these things going forward. And so when we scaled, you know, what is your HRIS system and, and what are you using for your finance system? And, you know, there, there are stages as a startup where you use the cheap piece, right? You, the <laughs> inexpensive route, you're using QuickBooks, you, you do what you have to do to get by. And then when you get to the next level, well, that's money you still have to decide if you want to spend or not. Can we hold on a little longer? And then, you know, each, so each level of funding. Yeah, you and keep outgrowing grow. tech, you yeah, grow, exactly. outgrow technology, people, space. A hundred percent. And and then you're looking at, okay, it's no longer how we just manage onboarding and offboarding of, of employees, but how do we create an environment, a culture that is, that is going to be rich and, and give them something where they want to come to the office, right? Or, or that they enjoy showing up for work every day, even if it's remote. So I know how many people are in your offices there in California? So at our Santa Clara office, we probably have somewhere around 20 to 50 that, that could show so up. So you got a lot of remote people then. Uh, exactly. The rest is remote, right? We've got a very large office that we opened in, in India for our support and, and engineering team there. I saw you have 100, 100 plus people over there. It's round the clock, right? So when our team goes to sleep here, the India team picks up and keeps developing and and. It's just nonstop, 24 hours a day. So I swear, I'm, I've never been to India, but I, my sense is if I went there, it would just be like, hey, what do you guys do for a living? And everybody would say, I develop logistics software, supply chain software. Everybody. <laughs> everybody over there is doing There's tech software. <laughs> certainly tra transitioning for sure. I mean, it, it's uh, we're getting a lot more investment into this space, a lot more attention certainly over COVID. It just highlighted the pain points that we – we're fortunate enough to already be in position to solve. I mean, we were in position to solve Brexit uh, when when that happened. And to this day, I don't think they have all the they they still have some glitches. They don't have uh, all their trade and global agreements together, right? No, they they don't. And and think about it, it for those that don't know what Brexit what happened. But in the UK, it was as if we annexed New York. Right. And, and now anything coming in or out of New York had to have a formal export declaration and a formal import declaration submitted to the federal government, you know, to, to this state of New York at that point or the country of New York. That's what happened in the UK. So they no longer were able to just send a piece of mail uh, to their to their friend in Spain or send them a jacket or oh, send yeah. your family, a you know, Christmas. Well, gift. and there was a lot of country, a lot of companies that were in Britain or England, I'll say. And they needed to be able to have that EU access. And so they moved. <laughs> and I, I don't, and by the way, I just finished a, a book and, it, and it's talking about the future and says, look, you know, the EU might, it's still an experiment. It might not work out. <laughs> so I'm like, this will keep you guys busy for years to come. Absolutely. <laughs> So what, one last thing about the people. So how do you keep, when you grow that fast and you have all these remote people, you have an India team, how do you keep that culture going and fresh and healthy? Well, I think uh, a lot of it came, you know, we, we have a number of tools that we used to use uh, for these video type calls, right? Today we're utilizing Teams. But essentially when COVID first happened uh, in, I guess it was the 13th, uh, it was Friday the 13th in March. And is where we said, okay, n nobody comes to the office anymore, right? Everybody's remote. 
And this could, this could, you said this could go on for weeks, guys. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we originally started out by having our web call tool at the time, which was a system called High Five. We had channels on almost like a TV station where people could tune in and say, okay, engineering that's handling, you know, customs clearance in the United States, you can tune into this channel and, and talk to everybody that, that is, is on that channel or customs brokers in Canada that need support. You know, we had, so we had all of these channels set up that people could come in and out of all day as if you were going from homeroom to, to science class at all of these different classes. So we, that's how we kept communication and we didn't lose a step in, in development. And to this day, we still use them. Yeah. I, by the way, this podcast is edited by Natalie and she's in Columbia. We just got off the team's call just before I hit we got ah. kid to this podcast. So I'm so used to that. And it's funny when people go, well, how can you manage that way? I was like, I, I don't even know. I, I, I don't even remember the old way. <laughs> I, 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 there's people who, who work with me who are close by. We never meet. <laughs> we did, we're on team's calls. So. Yeah, uh, it's true. Anyway, let's wrap this bad boy up. So before you go, what's next for you? What's next for Clear now? And then what's new? What's next for this industry? And I would call this industry custom clearance. I Well, for me, I'm attached at the hip with the company. <laughs> so <laughs> where it goes, I go. Where I go, it's going to go, I think. And, and I think, so what's next is we have a bold plan of being in the top 20 trading countries in the world, which would represent a little over 80% of global trade. If we're operating- How much are you in now? We are in five countries today. Which ones? We are in United States, Canada, UK, Spain, and Netherlands. That'll keep, that'll keep so you busy. <laughs> we, we will continue that, that growth path from a geography standpoint. We're also continuing to expand our, to drayage. So we always said our beachhead was, was customs clearance because we know we can dominate that and do it well. Because if we can exceed what the next best alternative is, then you become the de facto choice, right? So we wanted to make sure that we were able to provide that to our customers and to our ecosystem, which we feel we've done. Now we can go as far upstream and downstream as possible. So for what's next for us is our drayage component was just rolled out where we are now and what did we talk about earlier, right? Where is the connection between customers brokers to Joe's t- trucking company? We now have a digital platform, the same as our broker platform, and that, that connects And those that two. has been traditionally underserved. TM, a lot of TMS don't do the drayage very well. That's right. And so we've bridged that gap. We've got fintech products coming out where we can offer bonds and insurance and, and a lot of other things to help ease payment processing for all of this ecosystem that's a mess. We've got so much work to do. It's going to keep us busy for the next five to seven years easy in, in just trying to keep up with the with the pace of, of the world. That's fantastic. Yeah. But by the way, I, I say it too many times in my podcast, but I'm going to say it again. The number one question in this base is, where's my stuff? Right. But the number two question is, where's my money? And now you guys move into fintech. And they can, That's right. And start helping us out over there. There you go. So what's new over at your company and how do we reach out and talk to you guys? And by the way, I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile and a link to whatever marketing assets you give me, website, et cetera. I'll put a link to those in. Well, how do we reach out and talk to you guys? You're going to be at all the conferences? You got it. I mean, all of the conferences, the TPM techs, we're, we're doing as many uh, conferences and, and speeches that we can to get the word out. Because if you remember, this is a complicated and complex piece of business that we are entering into. And a, a lot of folks in the industry come back from where we came from, right? And And it's difficult to comprehend what we've done, but we're truly changing the way things are done in our in our space of customs clearance. And while the the thought of a downside for com- compliance and every other reason, we think that we have bridged that gap and we want to put pe- people's mind at ease that, you know, we're here, we're approved, we're authorized, we're the experts in this field, and, and we want to give them the tools to change how they do business. That's fantastic. And we'll go ahead and provide all of those links for you. For, yeah, yeah. You know, put our, them all in the show notes. And, and all of, yeah, that, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. And Rick, I really do appreciate it. And by the way, I'll be out at Manifest. Maybe I'll see you guys out there out in Vegas in January. That sounds good. Vegas, I've just had my friend Blythe on and she said, oh, it gets a little chilly in Vegas in January. I was like, I'm in Michigan, damn it. (laughs) (laughs) That is 
Florida cold. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, I hope to see you guys out there. And uh, I really appreciate see you there, taking then. the time. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversation with experts in the logistics field. For more details, visit thelogisticsoflogistics.com or follow Joe Lynch on LinkedIn.